All right, uh, good evening everyone. This is the uh, meeting of the Solar and Battery Storage Moratoria Study Committee. Uh, this is January 25th, 2023, 5.30. Um, we have uh, Area 58 with us tonight, uh, uh, taping this. And we also have a uh, Zoom <coughs> link, which is on the, uh, of the site for the uh, meeting of the Solar and Battery Storage and uh, we have a meeting ID and a passcode that goes along with it if anybody uh, wants to uh, do this through the Zoom link. Um, uh, just because we, we, we do have uh, Zoom tonight, um, let me just uh, go through the table here and just uh, uh, say who's here tonight. We have uh, Tom Bott with us on our right, uh, John Gatsky, uh, Jen Bogart, uh, myself, Bruce Mackey, uh, we have Roger Shores, Fran Mello, um, Sarah Hewins, uh, Steve Ward, and Savory, uh, 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 Savory Moore. <laughs> I, I knew there's one person I was going to mess up, but all right, we got it, we got you. So uh, we have enough for a quorum. Uh, Connie Shea is, uh, is uh, running a, a few minutes late, uh, but he should uh, be with us. We may have a couple of members, or we are going to have a couple of members uh, leave early, um, but uh, we'll uh, take care of that later. All right, so uh, tonight um, we have uh, some uh, people that uh, want to speak tonight. And uh, so uh, I guess uh, we'll start off with uh, uh, or unless, uh, uh, Mr. Bott, do you have anything to say before uh, I open no, this up? No, sir. I, I've got a couple of things, uh, some handouts for the committee at the end uh, for our next meeting. Okay. Nothing at this point, no, sir. All right. So, um, uh, Mary Dormer is uh, the first uh, concerned citizen of Carver. Um, if you'd like to get up and uh, speak. If Thank you don't you. mind, Mr. Chair, um, I'm here with Mary from Concerned Citizens of Carver. Yes, and, and what's your name My for name the is record? Meg Sheehan. I'm from Save the Pine Barrens Community Land and Water Coalition. And I just want to say that we appreciate the opportunity to help arrange to have speakers in front of the committee tonight. And we hope that it will be helpful and that it will inform your decisions going forward. Thank you. I'd just like to say that um, um, we have, uh, I'd like to limit this to a couple of hours, so if you could plan your time. Um, you know, we do have a storm that's coming up, and, uh, you know, generally our meetings are a couple hours long. So, uh, I, so if, if we could do that, I, that, that would be good. But what we want to present tonight is extremely important to any um, bylaws that might be made. And mm -hmm. as you know, we, we have, um, Carver's Concerned Citizens has put in, uh, citizens petitions for bylaws but if we don't get to finish tonight I would request that it be rescheduled so that we can continue it well, let's see how we do tonight great and I, I do believe each speaker will be you know 15 20 minutes we're not planning on any big presentations that will take okay. a lot of your time uh, Thank I just you. yeah I just want to say I mean as you're well aware I imagine I just want to say to the public that um, the, all of this will go to the Planning Board at at some point in time before town meeting and there there can be a public uh, meeting and discussion uh, with members of the public and and anybody else that wants to attend yes thank you mr. chair all right so we're gonna go on to uh, the next speaker which was uh, Catherine Harrelson concerned citizen of Kava Could you give us your name and if you live in Carver, your address too, please? Oh, sure. Uh, my name is Catherine Harrelson and I'm with Community Land and Water Coalition. And uh, I also and do volunteer work for Con Concerned Citizens of Carver. Mm -hmm. Community Land and Water Coalition is located at 158 Center Hill Road in Plymouth, Massachusetts. If you could pull so. that up to you and speak right into it, just I want to make sure that everybody can hear you. Thank you. 
Uh, so what I want to present tonight is uh, just concerning uh, solar bylaws across the state of Massachusetts. Um, last week, concerned citizens of Carver dropped off a packet to the committee. Uh, what we've been doing over the past year is researching and accumulating and reading and looking into some of what we consider to be the best protective solar bylaws across the state of Massachusetts. So we submitted to the committee a packet of information which we think will be most helpful and also what we consider the best of the best concerning protective bylaws that protect the interests, uh, the environmental resources, and the health and safety of the community. Um, so I just wanted to make the committee aware that that was dropped off to the town of Carver on Friday. And I just want to take a few minutes to highlight what I think is sort of the best part of the packet in terms uh, in consideration of rewriting the solar bylaws for the town of Carver. Um, I just want to talk about Exhibit 6. This is a 2019 draft bylaw from the town of Belchertown. And in this draft bylaw, uh, section 145-28, section 3, B3, um, the town of Belchertown has written into their bylaw, not permitted, no commercial solar voltaic installation may be permitted as follows, subsection 3, any solar facility requiring forest clearing greater than 10 acres. And this bylaw also in section 145-28D8 also requires mitigation for loss of carbon sequestration and forest habitat. If forest land is proposed to be converted to solar arrays, the plan shall designate an area of unprotected land on the same parcel or block and of a size equal to four times the total area of such installation. Such designated land shall remain in substantially its natural condition without alteration. I uh, just want to talk about Exhibit 7, which we dropped off. This is uh, updated 2022 zoning bylaws for the town of Warren, Massachusetts. Uh, there are a number of very protective uh, financial assurities with the which the town of Warren requires. They also disallow, disallow counting salvage in the costs of decommissioning, uh, taken away from the cost of decommissioning. What I'd like to draw your attention to is particularly the environmental protections that the town of Warren requires for solar installations. They require a phase one and a phase two environmental site assessment prior to the installation of solar arrays uh, for the protection of the soil and groundwater underneath the site. And section, uh, also they require follow-up water testing um, on abutting properties on an annual basis and at the termination of the operations of the facility. And I particularly would like to call your attention to section 12.3.8, design standards, subsection 13. The installation design shall minimize fragmentation of open space. And in subsection 13, environmental impacts. Proposed structures shall be integrated into the existing terrain and surrounding landscape by minimizing impact wetlands, steep slopes, and hilltops. It shall protect visual amenities such as scenic views, minimizing tree vegetation and soil removal, and minimizing grade changes on the solar, proposed solar array site. And finally, I'd just like to draw your attention to what we submitted as Exhibit 10, Zoning Bylaw for the Town of Plymouth. Uh, this is integrated into the general bylaws of their town, final section, I think it's 207-11. Uh, the town of Plymouth uh, recently has written very strong protective bylaws for solar installations in their town. Um, the town of Plymouth's bylaws prohibit ground mounted solar arrays on more than five acres in a residential area and they also encourage building on landfills and previously developed districts. This is integrated uh, just into section B location air requirements. Site plan review is not required for solar arrays that are located on a developed site consisting primarily of disturbed area. And they're also, uh, ground mounted, uh, they're not, they don't require site plan review for solar arrays up to 15 acres in size allowed on landfills within the rural, rural residential district zone. Um, they also prohibit ground mounted solar arrays that occupy more than five acres in any residential district and they're not allowed on parcels in certain residential zones for a period of five years from the date of disturbance of those five acres. 
These are just some of the solar bylaws that we have been highlighting over the course of our study over the past year. Um, we feel that they represent some of the best efforts across the state of Massachusetts to protect the environment, protect the health of the people, and um, also you know, work with the town and the solar developers to come up with best solutions for solar. So thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Oh, well, the yeah. bylaws that you cited, has the AG approved them? Uh, the, so I believe, yes. please someone correct yes, me if I'm wrong. Yes, Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. That was my question. Yeah, I know. I, I, when I read through these, I, I had the same question, and, and then I forgot to ask it. So thank you, Jen, for asking that sure. question. Can I ask a question? Yep. Um, on your uh, exhibit about uh, Plymouth, um, does Plymouth have a zoning district for agricultural? I I believe so. I believe they do. All right. Yeah, I would we, assume. All right. What are, the, what are the bylaws regarding solar there? Because we have a combined residential agricultural zone. Yeah. So. It's pretty much the same thing, basically. Residential black agriculture. Yeah, I would assume so. Well, I, I looked, I, I saw about four or five different residential right, ones, small, medium, small, medium, large. But yeah. I didn't see anything that, that mentioned specifically agriculture. Okay. Which yeah. would affect the smart program, for instance. Yeah. In a, sort of. Well, Plymouth also has a lot of cranberry bogs. So whether they call those in agricultural use or agricultural slash residential zoning, they have as many. You know, they just do. The I know they. I know they do. I just. I didn't see. We can get that. Too. Okay. Because yep, ours, exactly ours specifically says residential agriculture, and I couldn't yeah. find the word agriculture anywhere on, on their zoning. It's a, yeah, it's a good question. So just for the record, the underlying zoning here in Carver is RA, residential agriculture. So that's everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, including commercial, anything else. The underlying zoning is as Savory uh, described it. Yes, yeah, I understand. And thank you, yeah, thank you for bringing it up. I understand that, you know, the, the main zoning is uh, residential agriculture. It's also across other towns in southeastern Mass, too. So, thank you. Any other questions by anyone? Okay. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, if I may, Mr. Chair, I think next we have up on the agenda uh, Scott Horsley. Yes. Joining us on Zoom, I see his box there. Okay. <clears throat> it looks a little like the guy I you knew a while back, only somewhat more mature like me. Scott, welcome back. Nice to see you. <laughs> You're muted. Nope. Is that because of mine? I'm uh, okay. I'm unmuted. unmuted. You're unmuted now. I'll just, be, yeah, I'll just yes. be very quiet. That's okay. Am I coming through okay now? You sound fine, yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. A little bit of an well, echo will, with uh, that. I'll be brief. I, I do have a couple of slides if I'm allowed to show those. Is that possible? Uh, uh, we can give it, we can give it a try. try. Uh, let's see. Share screen. I, somebody's going to need to enable me uh, to show the slide. That's possible. Uh, we're looking at it now, so uh, okay. Hold okay. On. With my name on it? Yes. Sir. Yes, we yeah, can. can. Wonderful. Okay, uh, I'll be I'll be brief here. Uh, first of all, just the way of introduction. Um, I have about 35 years' experience working in the water resources field as a hydrologist. Most of the work I've done nationally for EPA, although I serve on a number of Mass BP advisory committees, work for multiple states, municipalities, etc. Um, 
I also have been involved in, or was the consultant with the state developing the Massachusetts Smart Growth and Smart Energy Toolkit, which I think is relevant here tonight. And then finally, I do serve on adjunct faculty at both Harvard and Tufts, where I teach courses in water resources management. So that's a quick introduction. Um, I've been involved in a number of solar projects across the state, and I just really want to talk for a couple minutes about the hydrologic effects of this type of development, specifically ground-mounted solar. Uh, the obvious change here, which is shown in the slide, in, in most cases we're going from a forested or vegetated site uh, to a, uh, a built site with solar panels. One of the discussions that commonly comes up is that the, the portions of the site will be revegetated. Uh, based upon the sites that I've seen post-development, that revegetation is uh, I guess I would just use the term sparse, to be polite. Uh, certainly no replacement for the uh, vegetative community on the left-hand side. And what I'd like to do is just talk about why is that important. And, and before I go to the next slide, I will say that uh, my work nationally for EPA and some international work, the common theme with watershed restoration these days is reforestation uh, all around the world. The United Nations is involved in it, EPA is involved in it, Mass DEP is involved in it. What we're realizing is we made a big mistake by uh, losing too many trees. And there are huge efforts underway, as many may, many may know, uh, to reforest areas, which, and as we all know, that takes a long time to get the kind of mature growth we're seeing on the left-hand side. So, so what is it with these trees? Why is it important? And, and that's really what I want to get into. Uh, there are a number of um, studies, publications. This is, this is in Nature, which is a very well-known um, uh, journal. And this is a study about uh, the thermal impacts of these installations. Uh, this report and others is also getting into the hydrologic effects, and, and, and they include this um, diagram. I just want to spend a minute on it because I think this is a little bit helpful to understand um, some of these impacts. So on the left-hand side is the pre-development um, or forested site that I showed in the first photograph. On the right is is, an, is a is a, um, is a picture of a developed ground mounted solar site, and there's a number of things going on here. So the the first thing is that we have the same amount of precipitation, of course, falling on the site pre and post. Uh, that doesn't change, uh, but um, we lose a lot of evapotranspiration. So the trees on the site on the left obviously are sending in Massachusetts almost about 40 percent of the precipitation back into the atmosphere. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, that evapotranspiration is significantly lost, depending on the site. They go down as low as uh, 5 or 10%, down from 40 to 50%, so that's pretty significant. So where does this extra water go if it's not being returned to the uh, atmosphere? And the answer is uh, it goes two places. It goes as surface or stormwater runoff, which I'll talk about in a second, or as it shows in this slide, it goes into the subsurface as infiltration or groundwater recharge. Um, on the groundwater recharge side, it's, it's pretty simple. If we put more water in the ground, the water table comes up. Uh, and as you know, throughout Carver, throughout southeastern Massachusetts, uh, there are a lot of wetlands. There's a lot of shallow water table. So relatively small changes in groundwater levels will have significant effects aerially on wetland areas, uh, as well as um, you know, just shallow depth of groundwater areas in terms of making, uh, in terms of meeting development standards. Because as you may know, most people know, there are minimum vertical separations for everything from septic systems to stormwater facilities to basements, etc. So rising water tables is a pretty significant issue. Uh, and it is, it is considered under the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Regulations as an alteration. Uh, and that's something that needs to be carefully weighed by conservation commissions. So uh, when we're, when we're clear-cutting a site of, mul of multiple tens of acres, 10, 20, 30, 40, or more acres, uh, this effect can, can be pretty significant in terms of the water level changes. Uh, the other thing that's on this slide is uh, energy thermal impacts, and what this what this study uh, really indicates that I just showed you a minute ago is that we create what we call a heat island effect on these sites. And this has been documented, uh, pretty easy to measure temperature pre and post, so this is not a theory, this is uh, hard data that this does occur. And um, 
the other thing I want to mention is cumulative impacts throughout a watershed. Um, in southeastern Massachusetts, we're seeing a number of these facilities, and in terms of uh, what towns I think should need to be careful with is not only the incremental effects of one facility, but numerous facilities throughout a watershed. And that's going to add up to significant hydrologic changes to wetlands, streams, uh, downstream estuaries, lakes, ponds, etc. And I just have one or two more slides. Uh, so commonly what happens on these sites, uh, because they do create stormwater runoff, is that stormwater is going to go somewhere. And according to current state regulations, it has to go into the ground. And once again, in addition to the uh, reduced evapotranspiration and increased recharge, we also have stormwater, which is infiltrated in the site, and that creates what we call a groundwater mound, which is additive to the other effect that I just mentioned in terms of the loss of evapotranspiration. So these two effects together, again, will result in, in significant uh, water level changes. Uh, I don't know that the existing regulations in many towns, and I think Carver is probably here too, uh, really have adequate uh, provisions to require hydrogeologic hydro assessment to look at this specifically on a cumulative basis throughout a watershed. And I think that, um, again, if, if we wait and let this happen and say, well, let's just see what happens, the cost of restoring these watersheds is going to be pretty staggering. Uh, there are communities on Cape Cod, which you may know about, that are going through very extensive costs right now to restore watersheds due to nutrient issues. And this is exemplary of the kind of costs that communities will face if they make mistakes and allow development to go forward without fully understanding those cumulative effects. And I think that's my last slide. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have them um, whenever that's appropriate. Thank you for your attention. Does anybody uh, have any questions? What, what what towns uh, you you were speaking about uh, towns that were having problems and uh, what kind of problems were they having? Is uh, these the ones that are near like ponds and in in the ocean? Well, I was I was specifically talking about Cape Cod issues, uh, Cape Cod towns that are dealing with hydrologic effects and nutrient effects, but in reality, um, these problems are nationwide and global. Um, in the U.S., 55% of our waterways are impaired. That means they don't meet water quality standards. Uh, and that is directly a result of cumulative effects of development. So uh, to answer your question, I was referring to the Cape Cod towns, but the comment would apply uh, nationally, in my opinion. All right, thank you. Anybody else have, have any? John? Hi, Mr. Horsley. Um, yes. With regards to revegetation around the uh, ground-mounted solar systems, uh, is there a preferred type of uh, plant vegetation that uh, we could recommend to be installed at the time of uh, construction? There was a lot of reverberation in that question, but I think I got the gist of it, but I do want to clarify, are you asking the type of vegetation that should be required as part of one of these ground-mounted solar projects? Yes. yes. Okay. okay, well, I guess my recommendation, first of all, not to clear-cut the site, and I understand the economic incentive to do that, but uh, perhaps, I know, um, you know, one standard that's been used in watershed of the impervious surfaces is no more than 15% of the site gets developed with impervious surfaces. So my first thought would be to limit the amount of cutting because, again, uh, replacing those trees I showed in the first photograph, I would suggest would be virtually impossible in areas that have extensive ground-mounted uh, installations. So the first step would be to minimize the footprint. 15% would be ideal. I suspect most solar developers are not going to like that. Um, but that would be the, that's the hydrologic number that is considered to be uh, reasonable in a watershed. Uh, you could go as high as 25% perhaps, perhaps development of the site, leaving 75% undeveloped. Uh, but then in the 25% that does, does get developed, the intent would be to uh, get as much um, diversity of vegetation and uh, full growth shrubs and trees as opposed to simply a a small amount of turf grass, which is what we typically see 
on these sites. So I think the answer is twofold. First of all, don't you shouldn't allow clear cutting of sites. That's that's going to cause problems. We we we've learned that. That's, that's not that's not debated anymore. That's pretty clear. Clear cutting of 50 percent or more site, you're going to have hydrologic impacts. So if you limit it to 25 percent or something like that, then I would suggest on that 25 percent to have um, uh, a, a diversity of native plants, both. Um, a canopy, shrub layer, as well as, as uh, ground cover. Okay, and, and this is for, uh, just so everybody understands, this is when the uh, the site is uh, decommissioned and, and the solar panels no. are taken down? Well, that's, that's why I want to clarify the question. I thought the question was for a development. For if it's decommissioning, then I would give the latter part of the answer that we the idea would be to try to recreate the native forest, which is both right. canopy shrub and, uh, and um, ground, ground level, ground cover. But um, again, as uh, you know, the, uh, as the Chinese say, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, uh, the second best time is today, and so forth. Uh, it's, it's pretty hard to, I don't know if your conservation commissioner in your town has gotten involved in requiring uh, people who cut down trees to replace them, but um, these trees go for, what, five, Five thousand dollars a tree, a, native, a mature tree. So if one wanted to restore one of these sites, which my prediction will happen, I mean these ground mount projects eventually, uh, it's probably three to five thousand times the number of trees. Um, on you know on a ten acre site that might be five hundred trees. I'm not sure. So these are these are expensive costs. I don't think anybody wants to pay, and that's why I'm suggesting preventing it is clearly the smart thing. To think about restoring sites. I'm not sure who's going to be able to pay for that, but we're talking, we're talking huge money. So, uh, so, uh, but you were also you talking also about, uh, uh, we still have the echo, I but, uh, I'm okay. I'm supposed to be quicker with my hand. Oh, I see, okay. Um, but you're also suggesting to put ground cover around the solar panels themselves, even when they're uh, being installed and, and going to be put to use. Only if you can limit the amount of clear cutting. Uh, as I said, I think right, I, I don't. I haven't seen this in too many local regulations. The site plans that I've seen for many of these projects appear to have something like 70, 80, 90 percent of the site being uh, cut, mm -hmm. and I think that's. Um, I think that exceeds any carrying capacity of the site where you could compensate. So, my recommendation about the planting is only if you limit the site development to something like 15 to 20 percent. Okay. 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 Very good, Very thank good. you. Anyone else, Sarah? Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Horsley, for being here. Great. I think I have okay. Time. My question is: um, I don't know whether you know what the percentage of the uh, groundwater degradation is caused by the solar ground-mounted solar projects, as opposed to other kinds of development. You know, I don't know if there's enough data to put a number on that at, that, at this point, um, but we need to look at, um, like I indicated before, the stormwater infiltration that's required for these sites mm -hmm. and look at uh, how that compares to other uh, impacts such as wastewater disposal. So I don't have a specific number. Um, I think as more and more sites get developed, um, obviously it'll become a more significant portion, but I can't tell you what percentage of the degradation is currently attributable to these solar projects. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just, just want to say that uh, most of the solar projects, we have had some ground-mounted solar projects, but most of uh, uh, the elevated solar projects, and m most of them are over the cranberry bogs. Um, the ones that were ground-mounted um, we've had uh, solar projects that were uh, over the cranberry bogs, and then there may have been a sand pit adjacent to the cranberry bog, and uh, and there they placed, uh, uh, I, I believe, ground-mounted uh, solar there. But we haven't had many where we have, where there's been a clear cut. Right now. Yeah. Okay. So well, far. yeah. Yeah. I mean, there there are some, but excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. But I'm I'm just putting that out because I I've, I've been here for 12 years on the planning board. All right. Anything else? I have a question. Um, the the water that now doesn't get a uh, 
thrown back into the atmosphere. You said it was the difference of between 40% and 5%. Does that water that's now getting to the ground eventually make its way to the aquifer? Yes. So it's, replen it's replenishing the aquifer. It's going into the aquifer, but it's not going in with the natural treatment of a forested area. And what I mean by that is, uh, I didn't mention this, but the uh, U.S. Geological Survey has a model that they've developed based on actual water quality that shows that uh, forested land removes about 90 to 95% of the nutrients and other pollutants that are recharged. On a site that's not forested, uh, those numbers are dramatically different. So, um, yes, there is water going in, but it's not the same quality. And as I mentioned before, the water level changes have effects on, on adjacent wetlands. And this is, is as, as, as you know, this area is, has a lot of uh, sensitive, highly permeable aquifers that are very sensitive to these changes. But, but you're correct. There is water going into the aquifer, uh, not, clearly not the same quality as natural recharge. Anything else, Roger? Yeah, do you, do you have any data or information on, uh, on the subject uh, in a housing development? Yes. The cutting and clearing and stomping and do you have any studies on that? In terms of the hydrologic effects or the water quality impacts? Hydrological. Yes, there are uh, studies on, you know, developed areas uh, that are related to uh, forest deforestation uh, removal as part of development projects as well. In fact, it would be a very similar, very similar effect as a loss of the evapotranspiration. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else, Sarah? Yeah. Um, so my next question is, um, how would one mitigate or even prevent that groundwater mound, that unnatural groundwater mound that you're talking about, for these type for these types of projects, solar so, in particular. Uh, well, my recommendation would be to limit the um, intensity of the project relative to the site. The numbers I threw out, 15 to 25 percent of the numbers that are used, those come from the Center for Watershed Protection in Maryland. Those have been recommendations that have been picked up nationally in terms of site development. Uh, and those have historically been applied to impervious areas in terms of impacts, but they, they could and arguably should be applied to uh, deforestation as well. So that would be, uh, th that is my recommendation, that if in fact the town wants to do, wants to consider ground-mounted solar projects, um, that, that some limitation like that in terms of the coverage of the site uh, my sense is that the, develop, the projects that I've seen proposed, it looks to me like they're attempting to clear cut the vast majority of the site, 80, 90 percent of it. And uh, it, you know, that's, that's clearly going to have impacts. Okay. Thank you. I don't, I don't know what project you're talking about, but uh, that's something that that this committee hasn't dealt with but all right any other questions well, I have one more have have other communities within Massachusetts put limits on that of 15 percent of a site not to, not to my knowledge for ground mounted solar but for development in general yes and, and I would I would suggest that maybe I haven't looked at all these bylaws but it's possible that this type of development might might qualify as a development so indirectly uh, yes, although I'm not aware of a town that specifically adopted a coverage, maximum coverage requirement for solar specifically. Thank you. I have a question. Okay, Fran, go ahead. My question is, is the water effect different if it's on a cranberry bog versus a clear-cut site? Yes, I think it would be different. How would it How be would different? Be different? Well, it would depend on the specifics of the cranberry bog operation, but the, uh, you know, there's a lot of water management going on with cranberries. Sometimes they're groundwater pumps, sometimes they're streams that are diverted, uh, sometimes there are ponds created. So we need to, look, that's not, that would really be on a site by site basis. And I guess, you know, my thought there would be to, at a minimum, require a detailed hydrogeologic investigation to sort all of that out so that the town can make an informed decision 
about whether or not this project is making things better or making things worse. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you very much for uh, that information. And uh, <coughs> we'll continue to the next uh, speaker. But uh, thank you. There were some good points made there. Welcome. All right. Uh, next is uh, Fred Bedell. Uh, Dual use solar and farming under solar panels? Not Barry Cosgrove. Oh, did I miss? Oh, okay. Oh, that was Scott. Okay. Barry Cosgrove. Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Barry Cosgrove, uh, Wayham. Uh, financial risks and implications. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we yes, can. Well, so thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to visit with you and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. My understanding is that. It may benefit from some of our experience uh, with dealing with projects like this uh, and the financial risks they can present for a town. Uh, I've had an opportunity to look at about 25 or 30 bylaws in Massachusetts, and I have not found one yet that did not have in it a couple of different sets of financial security to protect the town in the event that a solar project were to fail and these come up both in the context of decommissioning and in construction, both. So, that's decommissioning, and that's the notion that at some point in time, well, the project will have a useful life, and the town, and presumably the landlord, private landlord, does not want to have a junkyard left on their property. And so what these solar bylaws have done is they have required that the developer of the project commit to a financial security of some nature that would make sure that 20 or 30 years from now, uh, they would in fact restore the property to its uh, prior condition. And uh, <clears throat> there's a great uh, debate about what the proper amount should be for that decommissioning security and being as that's 20 or 30 years from now, there's probably nobody who could get that number perfect. But I would submit to you that if I were working on the bylaw you're working on, I would start somewhere else. I wouldn't worry about the amount. I'd worry about the form of currency. Most bylaws give a town the option of having the security be in the form of a surety bond or in the form of cash or a letter of credit. Uh, I would submit to you that the, the best thinking on this, the best and the brightest, are thinking about doing this as a hybrid with a combination of the two. By doing a combination of the two, you're respecting the developer's need for cash to operate a business, but you're also respecting your shareholders, your citizens, to make sure that there's real money there in the future if it's needed to decommission the project. The solar project folks will want to buy what's called a surety bond, and I apologize uh, for those of you who know what these are, forgive me, but for those who may not be familiar, a surety bond is an insurance policy, but unlike your insurance policy where, for example, I pay my insurance company to cover my house or my car, a sure, and then they pay me if there's damage, uh, a surety bond is different. A surety bond is a policy that would be purchased by the solar developer for the benefit of somebody else, namely the town. The developer pays the premium, but the town would be the beneficiary of the proceeds of the policy. But surety bonds are not very secure when compared to good old-fashioned cash. They're not as secure because, number one, surety companies well, just like your insurance companies do. Number two, the town has to have an extremely extensive program to monitor and measure and report that the surety bonds remain current, that the premiums remain paid, and that there have been no breaches. So you have to have a bureaucracy set up, in effect, to monitor them. Uh, number three, the surety companies are no different than the rest of us on this call right now. Nobody really yet knows what the right number is because you don't have decades of actuarial experience and numbers 
it, it will tell you what the right amount is. So, so a surety bond is helpful. It's a tool, but far and away it's not the best. The best tool is cash. And if you were a solo developer, your first reaction to that would be a negative one. You'd say, wait, I have to tie up cash or capital that I would prefer to deploy somewhere else. But if you think about a surety bond, if for example, you have a surety bond that has a million dollars worth of coverage, the charge would be about 3%. If you pay 3% on a million dollars over 30 years, that's a lot of money. And if you intend to decommission it and play by the rules, that money is all wasted. Whereas instead, if a substantial portion of that was cash, the interest that would be under that money in the meanwhile would actually be for the benefit of the developer. So I think developers have been pretty short-sighted on this because they've been cash concerned. But when it comes to the town, I think the best bylaw would be a hybrid. It would be a combination of hard cash and a combination or, or a letter of credit or uh, a surety bond mixture, some blend. What we've been recommending in some, some towns is 50% cash. And then you have, for example, a, a rotating additional add to the cash or a cash bill over a period of years, which allows the town to have more cash security and allows the business to successfully grow and stabilize and be able to afford the cash and concurrently to bring down whatever portion of the surety bond uh, applied to the total protection. You bring that down while you bring the cash up. On the debate of what the right amount is, again, nobody's going to get this perfect. I think all of us would agree that. 30 years is a long time. It's going to cost more, not less, later on. What we're seeing the best and brightest do, uh, towns like uh, Charlton, Massachusetts, West Brookfield, Wareham is gladly heading in this direction of something around $400,000 to $450,000 per megawatt. And that number, by the way, is supported by an entity called NREL. N is in Nancy, R is in Robert, E is in Echo, L is in Lion. NREL is a division of the government that promotes solar. Repeat, promotes solar. They put together a five-person team, three engineers, an environmentalist, and a decommissioning company, and they came up with these numbers. Uh, it's also important in your bylaw, I think, to keep in mind that most decommissioning bylaw provisions address the solar panels and the racking and the wiring. You also have to remember that the batteries, the transformers, and the inverters, which are extremely high value items, um, also you need to think about and have security for the removal of those. Those items have more hazardous materials in them potentially than, than the solar panels um, themselves. <clears throat> Another thing to watch out for um, is this. What we're seeing is the solar developers promise the moon. They'll say to you, okay, well, we'll agree to 450 per megawatt, for example, whatever the number is. But then they want this crazy provision, which is really an IQ test. The provision says, but then we'll just we'll renegotiate it right before the construction starts or right when we're ready to open. That's the last thing you want to do. You want a bylaw that says you set the amount in advance and maybe you go back and revisit it every five years, but you don't negotiate, spend months negotiating, and then give the developer the chance to negotiate the whole deal, uh, you know, right before the first pitch of the game. That seems to be their latest gimmickry. And as I say, it's, it's really an IQ test, and I know you guys will not flunk it. Um, I would also um, point out that, that, um, there, that this NREL organization is a, is a published Publish their numbers. It's a readily available document. Uh, it's it's something that the solar industry is choking on, but they're having a problem with it because, frankly, they had their way with towns for better part of it, and towns are waking up to it. And uh, you don't want to be left with this liability. I would also point out to the landlords. This stuns me. I don't know why the landlords themselves aren't asking for the same protection. It's their property that could be uh, left in diminished value. They too, in my judgment, uh, should require um, 
uh, should require uh, some level of financial security. Um, I was asked to speak to, to these issues, and, and I'm happy to state to those issues, but having had the benefit of listening to the prior speakers, I would just offer a couple other bits of, of, uh, of my own experience with these things. And that is that solar bylaws have been used and weaponized as a gimmick to cover up tree removal that's unpermitted and sand mining that's unpermitted. And what I think a solar group has to do is be very careful the hard work that goes into creating a, a good solar bar, solar bylaw is not in effect ultimately used up as a tool to cover up uh, illegal sand mining. Uh, and you should consider very carefully uh, a provision that says that you will not grant the permit any site that's under investigation or has not complied with your local laws uh, in, a, in a fashion that created the open space in the first place. <clears throat> I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I hope that's helpful. Anybody have any questions? All right. Uh, Seeing none. Uh, no. yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for the uh, information. You're welcome. For being here being tonight. Here tonight. <laughs> All right. Next is uh, Fred Bedell and uh, dual use solar and farming under solar panels. Good Hi, evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, thank you for allowing me to speak. And um, I am a farmer in Western Mass. That's my farm in the background. Um, and I can speak generally to farming issues related to uh, solar, but of course the situation in uh, cranberry country is a very special one that I have no personal knowledge of. Um, but I do have some sort of general comments and then I can maybe get a little more specific. Um, the cranberry beef industry, if we can call it that, cranberry growers, seem to be the, the only real sector of Massachusetts farming that is, is pretty gung-ho towards solar. And I personally don't, I don't understand the entire reasoning for that, but I can tell you that um, the other parts of the farming industry in Massachusetts are not excited, or in fact, many, many individuals and in organizations and towns are quite fearful about the pressures that this, um, this program is going to create on farming and farmland and the farm industry. So, and now it's a couple more general comments. Massachusetts has a local food action plan that was adopted, uh, I think in 2015. And the goal of the state is officially to increase the production of local food and to increase, um, you know, provision of local food into our state and our communities. And there's just really, you know, as I've been farming for 25 years, which is not that long a time for a farmer, frankly, but there's certain things which are just very self-evident when you're a farmer. Um, and in Massachusetts, we've spent 400 years removing all the trees and digging up all the rocks. And now we're talking about reintroducing shade and uh, ground obstacles. It obviously flies in the face of, of reason that this is going to make farming um, more cost effective or more productive. It's not. I mean, clearly what the result of solar on farmland is going to be less food, less farming, less farming industry, less farm production, um, less farm infrastructure, uh, et cetera. So this is something which, you know, what can a town do? I understand a town can't do that much. This is a state policy but it's one that um, many farmers are very upset and concerned about. Now, um, I, I could present, I could um, talk a little bit about some bylaw suggestions. I have no, also no knowledge of towns that have very particular agricultural bylaws related to solar, but I do have uh, a very good document that was put together by um, a Connecticut expert who's, who's really one of New England's experts in farming, both farm soils, farm businesses, farm transitions to new new owners, etc. And he has put together um, a document which I can share on the screen if, if this is something that maybe would be helpful just to run through this quickly. Um, can we share my screen? Yes, you may. Sir. All right. 
All right, I don't know if you're able to see this. Is that visible? Not, not, not yet. Not we sure don't see anything. Hmm. Maybe. How do I share screen? Jimmy. Oh, here, let me share screen. Yes. Do that. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, how about that? We can we see that. My, my tech consultant helped me there. So I'll just uh, page down here. So we start with number one, inventory and understand the physical, chemical, and spatial properties of soils. And I'll just say, you know, I think a lot of the general public they don't know what goes on on a farm in the best of circumstances, let alone once it's behind a chain link fence and an arbor variety hedge. And, you know, the, there is no, I can tell you, I do understand the state's program for approving these um, solar, dual use solar projects. There is very, very little, if not no, actual um, sort of conditioning of the construction or, you know, continued operation of these things as part of that program. This is a big gaping hole. But this this uh, this expert, his name is Kip Kolsinskis. He's a consulted conservation scientist. This is what he wrote here. Um, so first, have a soil scientist provide transects, high intensity order one soil surveys, and or et cetera. You can read down there. And it's have a soil scientist on site during excavation activities to guide the separation or replacement of major soil horizons. Et cetera, et cetera. Complete baseline soil tests, soil compaction, you know, with rates specified up to 100 psi, et cetera. Minimize soil disturbance, compaction, bare, bare soil, et cetera. Utilize and improve existing farm road system where possible. Reduce road widths. This, this bullet point after bullet point of details. Manage the site, soil, and plant community throughout the life of the project to facilitate possible future agricultural use. Etc. And then, then this point, which undoubtedly are, this is a problem for Massachusetts because the way these programs are being, um, these projects are being approved is they're handed to the town as a design that's already the engineered design for the project. And that doesn't really give the town much uh, opportunity to ask for the design of the program to be changed to, to improve its um, impacts on the town or on agriculture. Um, Anyway, I can make this document available um, also. I'll go back to stop sharing. Where is it? Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm sorry that that probably is uh, not that useful to you to go through those bullet points in that cursory of fashion, but I can make the document available. But um, what else can I say? I guess, you know, as a farmer, I want the cranberry growers to succeed. Of course I do. I would, I would love to have, you know, more fresh cranberries and more, you know, frozen cranberries produced in Massachusetts. And I hope that that's possible in the future. I'm not against cranberry growers. I'm in favor of cranberry growers. And I'm in favor of all farmers and all farming succeeding in Massachusetts. And we're under tremendous financial pressure in the farm sector from all kinds of things. And the solar just is an absolute... You know, it's a curveball. It's really, a, it's a problem. That's that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Now, where are you where? from? What state? Are you from Massachusetts? Or? Well, my family came here in 1640. Oh, so you've been around for a while. Okay. He said Western Mass. Oh, Western Mass. I didn't catch that. Yeah, I was just, um, I just wondered because it didn't seem like uh, you knew what was going on with the cranberry growers here, but uh, it. I, you don't have cranberries where you come from. No, I grow up blueberries, which are related. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Any questions? Yes, Steve. Bruce, I just wanted to kind of respond to Fred a little bit. He, he, um, I'm pretty impartial on the uh, dual use solar. I could go either way. But some of the growers um, felt that as a result of hotter sun, we were having more scald problems and the bogs were heating up more and they felt that that one of the benefits of having solar on the cranberry bog would be s somewhat shading mm -hmm. the cranberries and giving them a break and helping with our fruit quality. So 
I just wanted you to kind of understand one of the angles that folks were thinking of, Fred. So, thank you. Well, I would just uh, mention that I went. I had, was lucky enough to go on a tour with the, the Dick Ward spoke at this this last <laughs> fall, and actually witnessed uh, cranberry parts. And <laughs> what was apparent was that the wet harvest method is going to be a real problem under the solar arrays. And I, my understanding is that the wet harvest method has sort of saved Massachusetts cranberry industry over the last 30, 40 years. So this seems like I would certainly like to hear from a cranberry grower how they're going to, you know, effectively use wet harvest techniques under these solar arrays. There certainly are going to be challenges with it, but... Uh, you want to tell them who you are, Steve? Oh, St Steve, Steve Ward. <laughs> Who's your dad? Dick Ward is my dad. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, you want to get that no, out. <laughs> appreciate that, Tom. So, so uh, anyway, there there are challenges with it. I I didn't want to take the challenge, but there are. I did. I don't want to take away an opportunity for a cranberry grower to to try it. Um, so that's you know I I support cranberry a cranberry grower that's willing to try it. Any other, John? Uh, yeah, with regards to uh, the solar arrays, first, do you do you have solar arrays on your farm? I do not. My farm is uh, APR. Okay. Um, with are you familiar with? Uh, are there any farms around you um, that have solar on them? Um, yes, there are there are farms around that have some that there's a you know some five acre rays here and there, and but in general the only farm use up till now in the Connecticut River Valley has been accessory use that's on buildings and in you know that sort of area. There's lots of large farm buildings that have solar on them, and even some decently sized arrays that are sort of next to buildings, but nothing on the scale of you know, covering entire landscapes of solar on farm fields yet. Okay. Uh, so the, the biggest question that I have is, um, if you're aware of uh, like soil changes with the, with uh, specific poles, uh, different types of poles being in the ground uh, or around the plant life, uh, if, if uh, one type of pole over another type of pole seems to uh, maintain the soil quality um, or degrades the soil quality with regards to the uh, being around the plant life well uh, you know I can't speak too specifically but I, I do know that you know there's certainly I'm alarmed at the talk of the the wooden treated uh, arsenic treated wooden poles that potentially would be used in the, the cranberry box that that seems like a you know sort of a no-brainer that that can't be a good thing but I do, you know, in terms of whether the poles themselves, steel poles, have particular soil impacts, they probably do. There probably is some issue, but uh, there, there are other many larger sort of issues related to um, how the soil on farm fields will be probably permanently altered and impacted by, you know, these arrays being in place for 30 years, 20, 30 years. And, the, you know, one of, one of the impacts is the trenching that's going to be done because these things require extensive trenches that are 30 inches deep uh, that are filled with um, builder sand and then the, the uh, you know the conduits are laid into the sand matrix that's my understanding of, of one of the bigger rays that's proposed out here and the thing is 30 inches deep is that's nothing when it comes to the roots of plants I mean alfalfa roots go 10 feet deep for example so this is, these are like essentially creating French drains around the farm field that will change the hydrology. And the way that the water, of course, comes off of these panels, if you think of it, they're like shed roofs that are gonna cover extensive areas with impervious cover, and that water is gonna come cascading down from eight foot height and hit the ground. So that's gonna be a complete different soil and hydrology situation from what happens when you know, every raindrop hits a leaf of a plant. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, seeing none. Uh, thank you for your, your information. 
And uh, happy to see that uh, you're from Massachusetts. <coughs> I didn't get that in first. <laughs> Have a good night. All right, now that we've had those speakers, is there anything further that, although this isn't a public hearing, but uh, I don't know if uh, uh, Mary Dorma has anything more to say or? We're curious to know if you guys know how many solar projects are within the town right now. Uh, do we have that number, Tom? Uh, is it, you see it on the agenda, uh, a work in progress, but I think I heard 13, you folks provided us a list as well that's in the 402 pages of documents. Yeah. So I believe that's 19. And how many of those have battery storage on them? Does anybody on this board know? How many have battery storage on them? Right. Yeah, I, 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 all, all I can say about that is, is the first ones that we had, uh, it seemed like the first several years, it didn't have battery storage, but now no, the but now it's required. Do have uh, battery storage with them? Yeah. How many? I don't know the number. Oh. I can't tell you exactly. So I think I think one of the things that the residents of Carver are very concerned about is, first of all, how are the cranberries not being contaminated by the solar over them. Because most of these solar panels have PFAS in them. And as they degrade, that is going into the ground and it's going into the cranberries. So how are, we, how are you guys gonna deal with that in the future? I don't, we, we just have to take a look at that. I haven't seen that there's PFAS but in the panels, so um, I've, I've read a lot of articles mm -hmm. and uh, I, I haven't seen that. It's the, uh, the panels are solid and they're... They but as they degrade, the PFAS comes off of them. I, but I I'm, I'm don't not have ev any evidence that there's PFAS yeah, okay. in them. And as a matter of fact, I was just looking at this um, because we were gonna buy some pots and pans at home and I was concerned about the PFAS in the pots and pans, and they said that over the last half a dozen years or more, the PFAS isn't being used in, in it anymore and, and stuff like that. So I don't know, um, I don't know that, uh, I don't think that the solar panels have PFAS in them. Well, they do, mm -hmm. but um, regardless. Um, uh, I haven't so read anything that. I think that one of the things that the residents of Carver are very concerned about is the amount of um, uh, large solar in town mm -hmm. and how it's affecting our groundwater, how it's affecting our aquifer. And I know that um, you asked a question about the aquifer. Everything affects it. The sand mining, the removal of the trees, and we have to protect that aquifer. And I expect and that this board would take that seriously, that it would follow the EPA designation of the sole source aquifer, and that we would do our best to get really strong bylaws in that protect it and protect our residents. This is, this is a huge issue for me, the water quality within this town, and I don't think that it's being taken seriously at all. And I, I mean, I know every meeting I come to, I bring this up. We have to protect the water, period. There's about 200,000 people in southeastern Massachusetts that depend on this water. There's no other source for them. And if we contaminate it, we're going to contaminate all those people. We have the potential of making them all sick. And Carver will be at the heart of that if we don't start protecting the water. And that means that Carver has to clean it up. All right. Bruce, I think I speak for everybody on the board that that is a super high priority for all of us. Yeah. But I haven't seen that it has been a priority. I mean, we have been fighting for a, every board in town to pay attention to the water. We have asked that the sand mining stop. We have asked that we, we take a break, 19 large ground-mounted solar arrays in town. I mean, Carver's ground zero for every predatory company to come in and just say, we got it, they're dumb. And I don't think anybody in this room is dumb. But I think that's, that's 
what we're letting the predatory companies, they're coming in and they're just, I mean, we have everything coming in. Battery storage, we have um, solar. I mean, it's just um, subdivisions. And every time that one of these projects comes in, we're taking more sand out of town. We take more sand out of town, we take it out of the aquifer. The, and that sand acts as our filter. For myself, um, I found what Mr. Horsley had to say about the hydrology very, very interesting. Um, I do think it's something that we as a committee should discuss as we move forward with this. And I, I think in a way we've kind of, well, we're learning, number one. Number two, the state has been very specific in saying to us, you need to prove everything you want to change. Now, apparently, Mr. Horsley has been able to give us some information that maybe we can utilize for protection of the water. I agree with you. The aquifer, more than anything, is a big concern. And now, from my estimation, we have some information that will help us make decisions about it going forward. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for listening to us tonight. Okay. We really appreciate it. Okay. You're welcome. This, this is uh, not for the public. It, it's well, pub public. Uh, yeah, I, I asked for comments because uh, uh, Ms. Dorma was, was, was part of this uh, presentation. Her name was, was on the. Uh, well, this kind of has to go with what she did say. Yeah, but. I, but any more comments? It's a quick thing about an article that's on the internet that does say, my name's Patty Cooney, I'm by Cansbury Cab. It says, the Department of Public Health is concerned about PFAS in solar panels. You can find it on the internet. And you know, the Department of Public Health in this uh, Connecticut Water Planning Council says that there are PFAS in these solar panels. I just found a couple articles already about it. So it is in there. Okay. And you guys, as like you said, you're learning. You need to look this stuff up just to let you know. It's a quick search and you will find it. All right. It is in that. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Board members? All right. Well, yeah, I would like to thank you for bringing these experts to us because these are things that we haven't gotten into. The, the people that we've spoken to to this point seem to be from like the pro solar standpoint, um, you know, Eversource, a solar company. So you're bringing in experts in areas we haven't explored. And I would ask you, maybe Mary, can you come up here so? Have you looked at our bylaw and using the information you have and you know the expert resources do you have suggestions for the carver bylaw where they could be changes that we could see because we're talking you know hypothetical and from our you know we haven't even really sat down with our bylaw out and gone through it section by section so i would be curious based on your research if you have a suggestion for us to work off of because I know I would be interested to see that so we did put in a citizens petition for a um, a solar bylaw and it it, it has been submitted and it is um, we put it so that it would be um, no more than five acres um, I, I don't have it in front of me. Could you send it to us? Because yes. I, would, I would love to see that and have discussions based on that using the expert uh, input. So I would love to see so, your, you know, your there, ideas. There's a lot also on the, um, the DEP website. Like you, you can't have, um, you have to protect any, any um, solar array that's, on, that's dual use and by uh, water source it has to you have to ensure that there's no PFAS and that has not been done in town it I mean that's a DEP regulation there cannot be so like anything by the wee wee antic if there's a solar panel on on a bog by the wee wee antic 
that has PFAS in it, that has to come down that, because it's in violation of the DEP regulations. So I, I believe that we, we did um, look, I, I can send you that as well. So there are a lot of regulations that Carver has, whether we didn't know about them or the solar companies have come in and, and PFAS is, is a fairly new thing now and the EPA has lowered the, um, the health advisory to zero and the DEP will be following suit within the next five years. Uh, this is gonna be a huge issue throughout Carver because it is everywhere. And it's mostly around the <coughs> sand mining areas. And um, I, I think, you know, like the solar bylaw that, that we've put forth, I know that we put, I think we limited it to five acres, right? Yeah, we made a number of different changes, right. but certainly those but are available to everyone. Yeah, I'll submit it. Yeah, and then maybe you could ask the the experts you brought in if we could have their contact information for follow-up questions, because oh. they presented a, a lot of good new information, so I think it would be valuable to be able to contact them for follow-ups. Sure. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, guys. This was very valuable. Anything else? I, I did, uh, I mean, there is PFAS. Uh, there's PFAS in, in waters uh, all through uh, Massachusetts, from what I've read. Um, Kava didn't have, um, there's a map that I saw put out, I believe, by the state, and it shows the communities where PFAS is more elevated than others, and um, Kava was not on that elevated PFAS. But that's just because it hasn't been tested to the extent that other communities have. Because when um, the DEP and the, uh, the University of Massachusetts offered the free PFAS, it was not um, advertised within Carver, mm -hmm. even though the DEP had asked that it would be. Well, one thing that I, uh, I did read about I know everybody's concerned about PFAS, and, and rightly they should be, but um, it can be filtered out of your water, too, as far as from yes, what I saw. It can, but it takes granulated carbon, and that is a huge um, filtration system, and it, it costs a lot of money. Mm. And essentially what the DEP will do is look for the source of the contamination. I mean, you don't want any, uh, any one person, any one farmer to be um, responsible for all of their butters' wells. Th that's not fair to them. So we need to take the measures now and, and protect it. All right, well, I guess we can look into the materials that the solar panels are made before, as it's being presented to the planning board or conservation or whatever. I'd, I'd go beyond that, Bruce, and just say we're not going to allow PFAS mm. and any uh, solar materials going forward, period. Right. Right. Sure, yeah. 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 That that can be added to the bylaw, yeah. Easy yeah. enough thing to do. <coughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for that information. Um, there was a lot of uh, good points made. Um, I learned some things, and, and uh, everybody on the board... Uh, uh, learn something tonight from that so uh, we'll see if we can incorporate that into the bylaws um, I mean we have a short time unfortunately to the town meeting we have a lot of work to do I don't know if all this can be done by that time but we can try uh, like I said before when I spoke before the selectmen that this could be an ongoing process you know, over the, as time goes on, we can, uh, it can go to other town meetings uh, also. Um, but uh, I, we'll have to see how extensive the bylaws are gonna be altered or made new bylaws um, from the, the time that I was on the planning board. Um, it's pretty difficult to bring massive changes to, to things at one town meeting for people to understand, but we'll just have to take a look at that. But thank you for that information tonight. 
and we didn't go past 7.30, so it was great. It went much quicker than I thought it was going to go. All right. So um, next on the agenda was uh, concerns expressed from the committee members about solar and battery storage. And we had a list that we were looking at. And I think uh, we uh, we did uh, number one. We we spoke about what a direct butter was, and we also spoke about uh, interconnection requirements. And then we uh, spoke about removal of non-functioning panels, and I I think we had some language for that. Oh, it was removal of non-functioning panels slash maintenance of uh, the site and non-functioning battery storage. Did we get to that, Tom? Did we discuss that uh, I fully? I don't have a check mark on, on that. Yeah, my so. uh, my recollection is is that uh, uh, we had talked about. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna get to those in a couple minutes. Okay. Uh, I was actually looking for the list here uh, on our. Uh, uh, so I've got the list here in, in front of me. Uh, my recollection is, and I'll find it on the computer in just a second because I can't do two things at one time. Sometimes I struggle to do one thing at one time. <laughs> Does anybody remember if we uh, what we did? So the discussion that? was about uh, the requirement for decommissioning, but there was a comment about should uh, should the developer be required or the solar operator be required to remove a non-functioning yes. panel? Yeah. And I think the gist was, well, he would know more than we would that it was non-functioning, and what's his motivation to lose money on a non-functional panel? So I think that the, the gist of the committee was is that those sort of things about routine maintenance of their uh, is in their own self-interest and having a non-functioning panel uh, would be uh, to, their dis uh, to their disadvantage. Okay. At some point there may be an economy of scale where I got one panel out, okay well I'm going to have a tech to come out here, maybe I'm going to come out and replace one panel, maybe I'm going to wait till 10 or down. Hmm. But that's pretty much in their self-interest. We were more concerned about Restoring the site through decommissioning, uh, as the discussion went, right, as right. I recall. Yeah, th didn't one of the members? Didn't someone say that their solar was down for like a year uh, before anybody fixed it? Well, as an example, I would say the Route 44 that caught fire right there. A vast majority of the panels were ruined, and it's been well over five years. Those panels contain lead. There's lead soldering and various other items in there that should be removed immediately, especially if there's been any sort of issues with the condition of the panel and cracking and uh, they were subjected to heat and they're no longer functional and they contain materials that should no longer be, be there. And uh, I, I don't think that leaving it to um, the owners, I mean, yes, it would be in their best interest to re to replace them, but again, there's, if they don't replace them, they should still remove the old panels. I don't think that that, that should even be a, a question, it, and if nothing else, it would lead to uh, lower decommissioning costs if the panels are never replaced in the long run. Yeah, and aren't most of the companies that come in, aren't they like nationwide companies, so... We get we uh, you got a you got a field that's not producing too well here, but this one over here is producing great. So, or maybe it's even overproducing because it has a better shot at the sun, and it just kind of gets lost in the in the mix, so to speak. That it's not it's just not being monitored as close. So, you know, Plymouth Solar Field is doing great. Carver Solar Field is falling apart, but who cares because Plymouth is making up for Carver. 
kind of thing, you know? Yeah, I'm hearing you, but uh, I guess the practicality of how do you know mm. that in, and I'm just going to make a number, that there's 2,000 panels in a development. How do you know that row 14, number 7, well, isn't functioning from our perspective, from a monitoring perspective? Right. There's just no way yeah. we could know that. That's you know that's you know wholly on the onus of the operator to know yeah. well they they had to put up annual reports anyways right we could re yes require annual reporting and uh, part of that could be for non-functioning or otherwise damaged equipment to be listed uh, on the report it would show up in the output in regards to the field anyways yeah Yeah, I think that's the only way to do it. I mean, unless it was obviously damaged or, you know, cracked or broken or whatever. Fire or then, whatever, yeah. Yeah, then, then it would be good for the building inspector to contact the solar company to replace it, I guess. But, I mean, if it was on a big solar field, especially if it was surrounded by woods, forest, or whatever, or fences, and nobody would know. But with unless there was an annual report saying there so many panels were not working and they should be replaced. Or an annual inspection at the cost of the solar company by our local officials, the uh, electrical official for one. It doesn't take much to identify a non-functioning or broken panel. I know a lot of that stuff. I know from personal experience, um, the the solar that I have at my house is all um, it's reported electronically, so there's somebody can actually pull up my address and see every one of my panels to see if they are functioning. Um, they can look at they can look at the daily output. They can look at when you know basically follow it from sun up to sun down and say okay well the sun came up because we know he started producing this time and it went down because he stopped producing it this time um, and uh, it, it just kind of it's um, people anybody who's the software is there it just takes people to to go in and pull the reports and, and, and look at them as far as that as far as that stuff because they when I had a, we had an issue when our stuff uh, disconnected from the network uh, and it was offline for too long. Solar company called us up, said, "Hey, uh, we've been monitoring and you haven't been, you haven't reported anything for two weeks. Uh, can you go down and check, make sure you're connected?" Hmm. Had to go down and reset the system, hmm. stuff like that. So. So here's a suggestion. The planning board is the one that issues the permit. So what if we add something that the planning board or its designee may conduct a site visit of the array annually to observe any issues with the panels? Or if something is reported, you know, they can check it out. If someone comes to the planning board and says, I saw this from the road, it would give the planning board the opportunity to explore it at that time. But the planning board or its designee can do a site visit. Well, we could do it on an annual basis, but we could also require uh, annual reports, like John said, yeah. of equipment that has been broken or man malfunctioning should show up yeah. On, yeah. on that report. And then it would require an inspection, either removal or replacement. But in the meantime, if you didn't have to wait for the report, it would it would give the planning board the right to go check things out in the yeah, interim. Once, once the planning board, a project is up, running, permitted, done, it doesn't it put a lot of a onus on the planning board to be out there inspecting these. Yeah. That's not really their yeah. job. The opportunity to. The, well, so I guess. if I may. Uh, yes. So uh, what I just handed you is uh, the most recent draft of the bylaw based on the discussions we've had over the last couple of meetings. Uh, Savory had a couple of edits he had mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. so I sent it to him, he sent it back to me. So what you've got, unfortunately, it's got this sort of comment bar on the side which makes all the font smaller than it should be for people my age. Um, but uh, some of the things that we added uh, on page 7, 
uh, under uh, control of vegetation and in monitoring and maintenance was a pro provision to repair or replace non-functioning panels. Uh, so that is both in control of vegetation and is also in the uh, monitoring and maintenance. That, yeah. yeah, that's already there. Yeah, that, yes. We added that at the... Right, I think that oh. was, if, as I recall, that, that was one of your suggestions yep. to put it into two different locations. Yeah, all the stuff in blue is things that we added since the last time, and the stuff in red, strike through, are the things that we've taken out. The stuff that's in green in there are things that had been previously added to the original bylaw. So anything that's in blue is, is new that's been included. Uh, and those things that are in red have been stricken. Uh, and I think, Saver, you had uh, a, a couple of things in the stuff you sent back to me uh, identifying uh, options. Would we go with one or the other? Is that my recollection from? Yes. Uh, um, can you take us there? I think we're back on page nine. Uh, Okay. Um, I don't have my email that I sent you. But we had talked about. You have the email by any chance? I'll bet I do. Getting back to the what uh, Jen was talking about uh, about. Um, having the planning board or other people go out. Um, based on what John was saying on the solar panels on his roof, the technology is there for yeah. them to be able to see it from remotely mm -hmm. that there's an issue. So maybe we mandate yeah. that, that they have to put those panels in that they can monitor remotely and we give them a, a time period in which they have to replace them yeah. or fix them. Right. Yeah. And you know, I like um, I, you know, not not to take anything away from the planning board, but they're not. You can see a broken panel, but you right. can't tell That's if right. an unbroken panel yeah. is working or not. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think that we should rely on the experts, but put them put them to task yeah. to report back to us. And I think that electronic monitoring of each and every panel should be uh, should be required. Yeah, I think that's great. So would that go under operation, um, 3580.23 operation and maintenance plan put in there, I something probably, on the idea? It of, probably would. Yeah. The panels installed must be able to be. It would also go under the uh, inst installation because uh, it would have to be done as they were installing them. Yep. The, the panels themselves when first put up would have to have that capability. So in your email saver, you said, I came up with two options. Probably on the screen right there. Okay. And that is on? For 25-1A. 25-1A. I think that was a discussion about the setbacks, perhaps. Setbacks, okay. yes. I think that we got. So this is in the middle of page five. Can you, I, that's too far for me to read too small. Can you just read what I said that my options were? Please see attached. I came up with two options for 2580251A. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that we need for abutters to be able to waive the requirements. We don't need everybody to make a choice since the standard setbacks and screening are the default. See my next note on the smart chart as well. Yeah, we had talked about doing something where um, Can you open up the attachment? What did I say exactly? It's been a couple of weeks. I don't well, know. chances are that's exactly what you got in your hand, but let's open it up. Oh, okay. Oh, oh no, I see it. It's good and green, okay. Yep. All right, oh, I see this. Let me just. The, yeah, the, uh, on page five, in green, the first one is basically what we had talked about where every abutter would have to say yes or no. And it, it seems to be a little bit over kill. When really all we need is for the people to waive. Okay. 
have the option of reducing setbacks. Because it's already established that what the bylaw is. You don't need someone to say, okay, the bylaws, I want to stick by the bylaw. It's already there. Right. Um, but in the current bylaw, I think that's part of what the one of the issues was with um, with one of the projects um, was the uh, our interpretation that everybody has to um, right, and that has to, this everybody, everyone that. has to say something, and um, others are like, well, no, only the ones that are most directly affected by it and so uh, but that's being taken out where it's where it's crossed out provided the standard right, right. That by all direct I think that word all direct about is is where that stumbling point came in right but that's um, so but you're saying that the the first under a the first green section you think is overkill Mm. I think it's unnecessary because the bylaw already states what the setback is. If you don't want to waive that setback, then that's it by default. You don't have to say anything because that's the law. The only time you have to say anything is if you are willing to waive that setback and make it up to 50 feet. So you don't need, you don't need someone really to, to sign an affidavit saying, yes, I agree with the law because that's what the law is. By default, it is the setback that's established. It's only the people who waive that that really need to sign an affidavit, in my opinion. That's why I came up with two options. I think it just makes it simpler. And I think I think what it what outlines it is along the common border of the project. I think that was the other stumbling block. So by putting in the second paragraph with along the common, along their common border. They're not waving it for everybody, they're just waving it for themselves. Right, right, and, and anybody who doesn't sign the affidavit, the, the law as it stands is yep. in effect. Yep, I like that. I think so just for clarification, if one person on one side, if the guy in the middle says, I'll waive it, but either the people on both sides say no, that that 200 foot radius is still in place for the, the two outlying properties. From, from the point, yes, from the point where all three properties meet, yes. Now, currently, I, I, I believe that the 50 foot should be a much higher number, and uh, I think currently it's a 200 foot setback, and I, I, I believe that 50 foot is, is really taking it down to the, to the very minimum, but. 200 will be the standard. Right, right, but we're, we're allowing a reduction up to 50 feet, and I would think that reducing what we already require by more than 50% is, 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 asking, is asking a lot. The town agreed that 200 feet was an appropriate set, setback for, and I, from what I understand from what was presented to us, it's somewhere between 175 and 200 feet is, is pretty much the standard setback for for most of the towns that that were provided in, in the information here, so I, I I have a lot of issues with property values and various safety and noise and other issues with the 50 foot setback. But uh, it just gives the people the option to, to it, do. There that. could be someone who owns 10 acres that border it. He he could have an a thousand foot um, common border, and that property is never going to be developed. There are no homes there, no people there, and th that property owner should be a allowed to waive the 200 feet if, if it's not going to have an effect on his property. That's why it's in there. The, pers the, the property owner with the common border always has the option of saying, I like the law the way it is. It gives good flexibility. And it was 25 feet and we increased, so the original bylaw said under the large dual use large scale, 25 feet, and we increased that to 50. You did. Yep. Well, yeah, that was because we were having cranberry bog owners 
sharing a property line and it went yet yeah, to 25 and 25 so it was only 50 feet but if nobody objected that we 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 do it to 50 feet and 50 feet so that would be a hundred so yeah but um, my problem with this or a problem i have is that again i go back to the original intent and it was to find a way to achieve the screening not to be able to avoid doing it but to achieve it in a different way and this this doesn't achieve that it's just loosening things and then someone who talked tonight brought up something I hadn't thought of if there were soil or water changes within <coughs> a certain proximity to the the well or septic tank and I don't know how how far or close that could be but if it's reduced to 50 feet that may cause effects on the abutting properties that's not even taken into consideration when signed so so I disagree with the change suggested but then which one the, the first one or the second one? the one about the abutters being able to sign saying I'm okay changing the law because oh for the 50 foot yeah to allow the 50 foot oh, oh okay so but, I mean bylaws are, are laws I can't I don't get stopped by a cop and be like I I am comfortable going 70 in a 65 so well right now the law says they can do that the bylaw what I can tell the cops I can no, 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 go no, 70 no, no, no. <laughs> no. no right now the bylaw says you can waive it right but again but the the intent of it was to to put the screening and setbacks closer it wasn't just to get rid of them and I that's the problem with the way it was originally written and it's being interpreted differently it's the original in intent was not written properly to achieve what it was proposed to do the 200 feet was put there to create the buffer or yeah. the visual buffer right but the signing of the waivers the writing is not achieving the intent and how it was to be applied and, and that's documented in in planning board meetings planning board minutes talk to Amy Quessel there's stuff there too so it's just not being achieved and making it even more flexible just takes that away we I, should we should at very least provide a protection area of like 150 feet from residential wells on abutting properties I think we should have I I think a hydrology survey or a hydrology study needs to be done for any of these projects based upon what we heard tonight and a hydrology study would cover all of that I mean what Mr. I said, I forget his Horsley. Name. Horsley. Yeah. Horsley. Mr. Horsley said <laughs> I made real impact on my thought process with clear cutting and the aquifer. And, you know, 50 feet, 200 feet. I, I really believe, <coughs> my personal opinion for that is a homeowner or a, a landowner should be allowed. <coughs> onto his property and if he's okay with 50 feet for whatever reason he should you know it's an option it's not a mandate but the hydrology piece of it goes well beyond most landowners knowledge and I do believe that these solar companies should have to address that so more than figuring out whether it's 50 feet, 200 feet, waivers, or whatever. I think those are the protections that need to go in this bylaw for everybody. I think the Conservation Commission considers the hydrology on every project. But it's not inspected. It's not, mm. a, it's not part of the mm. bylaw. It's not part, it's not, mm. you know, Traffic studies are done for certain projects based upon whatever they are, where they are. I think because of the aquifer and because of the clear cutting and the deforestation and all of that stuff, that a hydrology study needs to be done. And I think we'll find that the solar companies will be more prone 
to do in the cranberry <coughs> bogs, which is where we want it anyways, <coughs> versus <coughs> clear cutting, which has happened <coughs> on other projects. Okay. Tom, uh, well, two things, things I was going to say, say uh, <coughs> regarding hydrology, it looks like probably in the land clearing soil erosion habitat impacts to add you know, uh, groundwater impacts into that section and we'll d drill down a little bit where to plug it in at on page seven, uh, seven in 358032. The other thing I was going to say is, um, now I've never been on a conservation commission uh, and never been a conservation agent, but I think the jurisdiction of the conservation commission isn't groundwater. I think the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission is repairing areas in wetlands. Our, right. our jurisdiction ends 100 feet from a be bordering vegetated wetland or any body of water. Yeah. Or 200 feet from a riparian zone? Yes. Or a stream or a... So if it's all upland... We don't, we're not involved. They don't even have to come in front of us. Yep. Yep. You get, a, uh, you get a, 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 an invitation from the planning board to submit comments, cause, or at least your agent does. Yes. So when we trip things out, when a project comes in, the site plan, special permit, that information goes out to all the departments and things like that for their comments. Right. So the agent might make comments about something, but as far as the Conservation Commission's involvement in solar, unless it was in those areas of jurisdiction, I don't think the Conservation Commission... We're, no, they don't have to come in front of us. Yeah. So. Nor do they have uh, any leverage to require somebody to do something. Right. Right. You know, we, we're... We're not responsible for what goes on under the ground. Shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> so. No, but, but, but people, people just get an impression about what some group does. Uh, sort of like when we were talking about the, uh, and I'm going to get it wrong again, the Pesticide Bureau. You got it. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's not, oh, well, the Conservation Commission and the Agricultural yeah. Commission should right. look at yeah. those yeah. things. And we find out that that's not actually what, what they do. So it's important to... So when we got a bylaw to make it once uh, 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 um, enforceable, and also to make sure that uh, you know you're you, you, you're uh, employing the folks who are going to look at things who who have got that ability to. Right. My question. I, I agree that that the hydrology is an important part of this, particularly with clear cutting forests and all the filtration that goes on with the root structure. And it's not just the trees; it's all the undergrowth. Um, that's even more important than the trees, actually. Um, is what are we looking for? Mm. What do we want the hydrology report to tell us? And what is what's the line where it's a yes or a no? Well, it should be minimal changes to the t hydrology. I believe Mr. Horsley recommended phase one and two site testing with pre-development and regular post-development testing of abutting residential. We don't want people's wells going dry. We don't want significant um, effects on the aquifer and the ability of people to get uh, clean water. Uh, I think we should limit the, the sites to no more than, I believe, uh, both our Conservation Commission and, and Mr. Horsley said that 50% is a, is a critical uh, problem with site clearing if you're clearing more than 50% of it. He said 25. Well, he said 15% of impervious surfaces. Right, so I, right, but I'm saying that anything higher than 50% is, is, is a serious problem according to both of them. Uh, and that we should be directing development to landfills and pre-disturbed or developed areas. Uh, Which we have in town. Well, to landfills anyway. Yeah, I, I, that was going to be another part of my suggestion. I think, you know, based upon what Mr. Horsley said, we limit tree clearing. Mm -hmm. um, well. And... and because we have so many cranberry bogs in town, and there is some place for the solar to go, which makes sense, keep the forest as much as we can. You know, and I'm not saying every cranberry grower is going to want a solar farm on top of his cranberries, but... I hear those words are a tough sell. 
I don't want to go picking through them. <laughs> you know, um, if we're trying to protect what we have here, and, and I agree that we are a prime target because of the state and their mandates. And I would hate to see us 20 years from now look like, you know, the middle of Arizona with the acres and acres of cranberry, uh, cram not cranberry, like you want cranberry, uh, solar panels. Yeah. You know, and, and so I think that's just my opinion. Okay. Limit, limit the size of the projects. Now, I was surprised that they said uh, one of the towns, hold on, I took some notes here. Yeah. yeah, I think it was the town of Warren. I think it was Catherine Harrelson was talking about the town of Warren that was requiring phase one and phase two environmental. Uh, not Scott Horsley. Right. He, he mentioned it tonight. I, I wrote it down All in right. the notes. Again, though, what, what? We were also told that uh, Belcher Town limits clearing to 10 acres. Yes. Limits project size to 10 acres. Now, Wareham tried to put in three or five or something, and that got shot down. But apparently, 10 didn't. Well, and while the question was, and I haven't gone back to look at when these actual changes were made, but I've made the case before that due to recent court cases and things and, and policy changes from the, the Massachusetts, the Attorney General is taking a much harder look at things that are coming in. So if you've got a bylaw, like I said, I, the bylaw that I wrote for Kingston and the bylaw I wrote for Falmouth both required uh, a maximum of two acres of trees that could be disturbed. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, when uh, a group in Falmouth came uh, with a proposal to convert a golf course to uh, 165 acres of solar panels, uh, because the golf course was a previously disturbed site, and in, in the, the both, uh, both, both of the bylaws I wrote, only previously disturbed sites could be used. So uh, sand pits, mines, things like that, areas that had already been cleared of trees. Uh, so a cranberry bog, something like that, had already been cleared of trees, might mm -hmm. be susceptible to something like that. But that maximum limit was two acres. So when these folks came back with the petition to want to clear more, they wanted to truncate their plan into three different areas limited to two per, so a total of six acres would be cleared over this 160 some odd acres of potential development. Um, the requirement there was uh, any, uh, that, uh, that tree coverage would be required to be s replaced with additional plantings at twice the amount of what was cleared uh, in those uh, large percentage of those uh, plantings would be pollinator species. Uh, so we're not just introducing uh, you know, native gra uh, you know, uh, grasses and things like that that are just easy for people to go out and hydro seed, but actually putting in plant stock that's going to provide a benefit to, uh, the, to the community, to the plant mm -hmm. community, and to the and, uh, for birds and bees and, and insects and things like that. Yeah, that was. Didn't one of them have uh, four times? Of what was removed had that to be planted. Is, uh, yeah, that's the Belcher Town, and I'm looking at right now in the information that we were given earlier tonight. It's Exhibit Six. It's I be done. Um, the p numbers on the pages yeah, are numbered. Yeah, four times. Four but times. It's, on this one, now they said all of these laws have been adopted. This says January 24, 2019, draft bylaw. And exhibit six, and it says um, forest habitat and equal to the amount of four times of the forest would need to be recreated. Now, is it was it accepted or is it a draft bylaw? I don't know. We we heard these were all accepted. In here it says draft. Yeah, we'll have to. I mean, it's. I, I don't know. I don't know how that. No, no, no. That's. I did not print 402 no, three times four times more than the property that, that you own. So that, I agree. That's the handout. Oh, no, that, I agree. That, no, the handout I gave everybody so, uh, earlier. <laughs> when you read it on here, it's yeah, different than what well. was spoken. Yes. So that's the truncated version of. She was looking at the page. Let's see. We've kind of wandered off the, <laughs> the we topic. Did. I know. Uh, we've, yeah. we've, we went on to hydrology and <laughs> no, stuff. I, didn't, I, I know. Again, just, I, just be, know. so yeah. we I didn't get. Yeah. <laughs> Getting but back. There was one, in, one thing I have to ask Tom, and in my experience, I have never seen anybody do 
a hydrology report for anything I, in in the civil engineering that in the land surveying that I was in I've never seen that um, I, I mean the only th I uh, the thing about the water table it fluctuates throughout the year you know during drought seasons and and so it's a it's a flexible thing um, I, I know uh, we had mr. Horsley talk about that to me panels on a cranberry bog or in a sand area is uh, is is not as important to me in terms of water as would be like a uh, subdivision or um, like a business area with a large parking lot and and things like that where you're actually not letting the water go through the soil because you have pavement there and then it's redirected into basins or um, something to retain the water or to hold the water till it could spill off into a, a, a wetland or a lowland area. Um, he said cranberry bogs were different. I yeah, asked him that very yeah, specifically. Right, right. So maybe the hydrology study only needs to be done for forested areas. Yeah, but like I say, I, the, and it's like, um, I, I don't know what we, you're looking for in a hydrology study. Though. That's, that's the, the thing. thing. I mean, I we can we test once yeah. or twice, but what, what are you looking we for? Well, yeah. yeah, that's why I asked for the contact. And let's, I'm, I'm not an expert. I wouldn't know what to ask for. I think but I mean, I, would. I, I was just puzzled because I have a little experience in that, and and I'm I'm saying this is the first time I've ever heard of anything like that. And I was just going to ask Tom before we, we wrap up for the night. That in all the years that you've been doing this, have how many times have you run into hydrology reports? Well, I haven't. So the, the principal concern I've always had about uh, solar, uh, and I'm a I'm I'm, I'm a, a, a allegedly a green kind of guy. Uh, is the change from taking a, 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 an area that's forested or covered uh, just with uh, plants and uh, you know sand whatever mm -hmm. is the difference when you start taking that area and then putting glass on a 45 degree angle all over the place what are the stormwater implications of that because all of a sudden instead of that water percolating into the grounds it still gets a chance mm -hmm. to do because you're leaving much of it impervious mm -hmm. it's just the rate that it goes in and right. that's the thing that we ask for in any sort of development is the stormwater calculations right how much water is hitting the site the stormwater requirements are essentially if a bucket of water leaves the site before the site's developed a bucket of water should leave the site afterwards not more or not less and that's the basis of stormwater studies. Uh, so I have not seen hydrology studies for things like this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we did a, a very large uh, 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 Plymouth Carver aquifer study uh, that was included in the 402 pages. I saw my name in there and all Jack Hunters and everybody from 2000-ish when we did this study. Uh, but I think the, the concern is to make sure that you're not overwhelming your neighbors uh, uh, with the site. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, where most of these solar uh, developments are happening at, uh, in South Carver, where we've got a lot of open space and a lot of sand, um, it would be pretty hard to push water off the site. Uh, uh, and that's typically the standard that we look at. So we can look at you know, the, hy the hydrological effects of that, but how do we factor it in there? Uh, you know, we kind of have to dig around and see if, if somebody else has got something like yeah. that. Well, I mean, if if you require that on solar projects, then to me, then you're going to have to start requiring it on on subdivisions and and business parks, and it, it, so it's just going to go. Well, everything needs a hydrology study, which I've never encountered in my life. So uh, I I just I I know I think we're just going off to a gopher hole somewhere. Well, well one of the points that was brought up tonight was the trenching and then the filling the trenching with sand and creating French drains, which I could, which really is what got to me in the point that that is certainly what is happening and the water is collecting and being run off into areas other than where it should be run starting from or ending. Well, I think that's something you have to uh, talk to uh, uh, the consulting engineer from Fuss and O'Neill and um, and see what they do about that how they handle that 
because they, they do a drainage study of the site when it's cleared and, um, and, and see what, if that's in their calculations or not. I think the farmer was talking about the trenching and ruining the root structure of the yeah. things. That I, I, yeah, I don't think it was yeah. in yeah. relation uh, to cranberry know, the, the, yes. the, the yeah. panels that are, are done here, uh, both the, the large-scale ground-mounted and, uh, <coughs> and the SMART program the, the agri on, on cranberry box, all of those, uh, all of those cables are run um, underneath the panels above the ground mm -hmm. to the end, and they're all attached that way. There, there's no trenching being done. Yeah, typically the panels connect together like Christmas tree strings, yeah, uh, and then at the end, uh, there's a, uh, a line that comes off, connects to a central line, and goes to yeah. an inverter elsewhere. So the only trenching is essentially at the end of all those runs, right? To take it to, uh, yeah, to the edge of the site, to the inverters, and off the site. Yeah, and that's whether it's on a bog or or on 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 the ground. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about testing with hydrology is that if you're testing once and testing twice, you're basically seeing the, seeing what the before and after is. If the after is no good, are you going to tear it down? Uh, you know, how, how do you, how May, do you? I mean, if we find out it's bad, but we got to do what's something the about it. Like, what's what's I, I the agree. threshold? What becomes I don't bad? know. We ask that guy. I don't know. I could make <laughs> well, stuff up Well, we have now, to ask more than that guy. We have well, five yes, guys. I, I but, it could be, but it could be if we have, if we get a before and we get an after and um, we find out that the after is bad, then we say, okay, well, uh, maybe we don't do that again over here. Well, I, I would if we, or if we have similar water flow patterns mm -hmm. at this next project, um, maybe we don't allow that project over there because it's going to because we have maybe there's more residents over there that's going to affect more people, uh, have a negative impact on more people as opposed I, to. I think more to the point is that. When we approve something, we should know what the impacts are. If the yes. impacts are different from what we were told or what we expect, that changes have to be made to a particular site, yes, to mitigate. Because what if your well dro goes dry? I, I can tell you that nobody wants that to happen anywhere in this area. And what the whole, this whole southeast area, the majority of is 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 by wells. And, and how many of you have driven through a flooded road because the, the groundwater is higher than it should be, that it's not being properly uh, filtered. Um, we're having trouble with PFAS and, and contamination in North and South Carver now. Uh, it's become a statewide issue as well as uh, the entirety of Cape Cod is having to deal with uh, septic and nitrogen and, and growth um, issues. And a lot of that has to do with uh, lack of filtration and, and, and improper results from what was expected when it was approved. I, I think we should know what we're doing and the more information that can be provided to any board in order for that board to make an educated and informed decision um, shouldn't, shouldn't be brushed aside and should be taken into serious consideration. Well, Yeah, I would hate for something to happen. We find out after that Fran's well went dry, and, and the answer is okay. We won't let that happen to Jen's, but sorry, Fran. You know, there's got to be a way to. If we find out there's a problem, it needs to be addressed somehow. So. Uh, all right, uh, Tom. So, uh, a couple things to get back to where we were working on before we got. Uh, you know, <laughs> we've been having a very it's been a swell night in the last stuff talk. But can we sort of <laughs> lock down uh, uh, one product for tonight on yes. uh, the setbacks? <laughs> is there one of these things we like better? I mean, we're not going to be done tonight, but uh, but it, was there one of these two options that uh, that uh, is on the screen here that uh, the, the group felt more comfortable with than the other? I like the second one. I like the second one. I think it makes it simpler, less paperwork. I think by changing it, we're recognizing the fact that uh, we required all direct to butters previously, and now we're changing it to individual direct to butters. And I, I think that that's something that's that's part of the issue in regards to this. All right. So I guess we're going to have to take a vote on that. Then, would you recommend that? Well, I'm, I'm just trying to 
we got a decision point. So I think I the, the second one is fine with me. I think that we need the, the flexibility. You're not forcing anybody to, to, uh, to take a 50-foot setback. Um, I, think, I think you have to look at there's multiple situations that arise that um, where projects are next to uh, wooded areas of other landowners and those landowners uh, would allow the 50-foot setback or they may be next to uh, another land, uh, another bog owner's property and that bog owner doesn't, he said 50-foot is fine with me. There's, there's many situations that come up and I think it's, it's good to have the flexibility. You're not forcing anybody's arm uh, to take it. Um, they, they, uh, if, if they agree with it, then that's fine. But I think it's, it's good to have some flexibility in the bylaw. And uh, just to say everybody's going to you know, do the 200, um, you, you just never know what situations that you arise. You get a budding uh, solar fields. Uh, the, there are all kinds of situations that, that arise that, uh, that I think to have that flexibility is good. I know off of Meadow Street, we had neighbors, there was they had pieces of property that were wooded in the rear yard. Um, the 50 feet uh, was wooded to the, uh, to the solar panels. And, and those people said, 50 feet's fine with us. You know, so it gave them the flexibility to, to do the 50 feet. Um, but I think both of these, both of these give that flexibility. Yeah, one is just simpler because it doesn't require somebody who wants the bylaw to, who wants to um, go what the bylaw says. It doesn't force them to make a decision and turn something in. The bylaw, the 200 feet is the default. So if right. you don't want to change that, there's no reason to sign a waiver. There's no affidavit. reason to sign a waiver. Yeah, so that's But if you want it, then sign the waiver. Right. Right. Yes, uh, that's, and that's the second one. <clears throat> but the first one does that too. Yeah, but the first one says uh, each direct abutter will have the option. So now you're talking about every direct abutter saying yes or no to whether they want to waive that. The right. second one only is the people who want to waive it having to sign something. Everybody else. But goes but by the no, default. it doesn't. It doesn't require that everyone sign it. It just says that um, because it says failure of a direct abutter to return the affidavit will retain the standard setback. So basically, if you don't want it, you don't do anything. Yes, but still someone has to mail that out to those people and has to have to keep track of whether it's coming back in. They should all be notified if, so, if there's going to be reduction in setbacks that might affect them. Wouldn't you That's think? Not, it won't, I mean, it won't affect them. I mean, if I'm a, if I'm a direct abutter to a, uh, if I'm a direct abutter to a, a, a solar project, you're going to I would hope I would hope that somebody would contact me anyways. Yes, you're going to be notified anyway, but if you if uh, if you are contacted and you know that there's a 200 foot buffer and you're fine with that, then you don't you have don't to do, do anything. anything. Right. That's what the second one says. The first but one says you have to you can return it or a failure to return it means that you said you want to maintain the 200 feet. Right. But again, that's more clerical. That that it's an extra step that I don't think is necessary. It's only the people who want to waive that 200 feet who have to return something. Not everybody. <coughs> I just think it's, it's, uh, it just seemed to be too much work for people who, who want, the, want the law to, want to uh, go by what the law already states. I just don't see the reason for people saying, yes, I agree with the law. That's the way I want it. By default, that's the way it is. They, don't, they shouldn't have to make a point of saying, yes, I agree with the law. It's the people who want to waive the law who are the only people that I think should, should uh, have to send something in. I just think it makes it simpler. I, I think that the language in the first one is going to confuse people at the town meeting. Good point. All right, should we take a vote? Uh, how do you well, I make a motion? Yeah. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the awarding uh, 
being good at it. On page five, that says direct about is to a large scale mounted solar photovoltaic installation have the option of reducing the setbacks to a minimum of 50 feet along their common border of the project in a residential agricultural, agricultural zoning district by providing a signed affidavit that waives standard setbacks and screening requirements. This affidavit must be on file with the planning board and referenced in the special permit decision. That's my motion. <laughs> I'll second it. So I have a motion and a second. Okay, we're going to have to do this by roll call vote because it's, well, we were on Zoom. But we'll, those roll call, it's good. Yeah, roll, so uh, we'll start with John um, Gatsky. Hold on, uh, just a couple of, uh, mm -hmm. a question before voting here. So on uh, the, se the one that we're voting on, whether to approve or not, who contacts the abutters? Well, the, I think the applicant would have to do that. The applicant. Okay, but in the first one, it, it specifies that the applicant contacts the abutters. Because it says that they are required, the applicants <coughs> for solar are required to contact all direct abutters in a residential agricultural zoning district okay. to ascertain whether yes. they would be willing to waive the standard. Hold on. So I'm going to, can I amend it? It's okay with the second. Not that I'm doing the chair's job here or anything like that, but it is late. <laughs> uh, uh, what do we, so Fran is talking about amending her motion yep. uh, to include John's concern yep. or John's comment about uh, require all direct abutters uh, the applicants required to uh, contact all direct abutters yep so it could read the applicants and starting with a the applicants for large-scale mounted solar LG that letters are required to contact all direct abutters in the RA zoning district in the RA zoning district who then have the option of reducing the setbacks. My question is, is this in every case or, or is this specific, because we're not making it specific, to reduce setbacks? If you wish a reduced setback, then... Because is every, applic is every application going to be sent out in regards? I, I'm just asking. I see what you're saying. Yeah, okay, I think we started off with A that says reduce setbacks for. In, I, it should probably be in order for the applicants to receive reduced setback, uh, a reduction in setback requirements. Then. Well, we could start with exactly what's there. Reduce setbacks for the applicants for a large blah, 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 blah are required to contact all direct about is in the IRA zoning district who would then have the option of reducing. So just kind of tweaking, taking what was there, tweaking it a little bit to say, if you're looking for a re reduced setback, here's the process. So reduce setbacks for the applicants for that all that stuff are required to contact all direct abutters in a residential agriculture district to attain to ascertain whether go ahead Fran give me your text again I'll uh, to ascertain no jeez uh, uh, can I have it for the next meeting <laughs> I was, I was just gonna you know I, I was I, I was kind of thinking that we could we could set this as essentially two paragraphs so we have um the first part being either a or b and then a second section that says um reduced setbacks require um the applicant to uh, contact the butters um 
Well, can I just say, just considering the kind of wordsmithing we're doing, mm -hmm. how about if we don't get this thing knocked out tonight, we withdraw the motion, and mm -hmm. we have a text yep. to come back and talk about at the next well, meeting, and, okay. and sort of drill down on that. And Fran, if you would be yep. so kind to volunteer. Yep. <laughs> You're so good. Yeah, I think it's pretty easy. I'm looking at it. Take one sen sentence from the first one, add it to what Savory is written on the second, and I'll come back to you. Okay. And as soon yep. as I as soon as I see it, I'll send it out to everybody else. Okay. So the motion and the second uh, have been withdrawn. Withdrawn. Okay. We're getting there. All right. All right. So um, oof, where was? Where are we now? And we're going to 7:45. All right, we have uh, a couple of meetings scheduled. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so if I may, Mr. Chairman, so I had suggested yes. uh, meeting uh, the next couple weeks, February 1 and February 8th. Mm -hmm. uh, hearings for the planning board are going to be March 7th. Uh, we'll be submitting uh, things to the publications of the newspapers uh, probably uh, the 15th of February. So I'd kind of like to get uh, some of these buttoned up uh, to the best that we can. Yeah, I saw a couple of emails. One of them looked like it said March 23rd, 22nd, 23rd for zoning bylaw hearings. Well, we, no, we, what we had talked about at the planning board meeting was having a dedicated meeting uh, for zoning bylaw hearings. Uh -huh. uh, and so getting off the regular schedule. So March 4th, I think is that first Tuesday uh, of March. Uh, so we'll be um, we're basically in the, in the planning board. We'll likely be meeting. Then when are we three or, see three or four Tuesdays in February? Yeah, uh, we're likely going to use them up all use them all up uh, between these things. Uh, and those. Now, the hearings have to start, but the hearings don't have to close or, or finish until we get to town meeting. But we certainly have to got open them and. and, and Get to work yeah, because I saw because yeah because one email came in Tuesday March seven. Yeah, that's our that's our target date. Connie had said I'd like a dedicated yeah. date for that, and that's what we. Call. I think the board actually talked about it. Three thirty and three thirty one. Zoning bylaw hearings at the middle school. That's last year. Yeah. I think we arranged for the police station this yep. year. Yep, police station March seven. Oh. In fact, uh, yeah. if you go on the yeah, that's uh, if the you go email. The, the email came out, and it said this was what I received today, 2022. I didn't even notice it. It said 2022. Okay. Yeah. So actually, uh, there on our website, the planning board's website, there's a a, a note that says hearing date uh, the March station. 7th at the school. I mean at the uh, at the police station next door. So that's what we're targeting. So anyhow. Yeah. Uh, so back to the point. Uh, yeah, the uh, the projected schedule here for us to meet. February one, February eight, uh, at five thirty. At five thirty. Okay. okay. Does that work with everyone? It uh, Concom has a meeting right here at seven o'clock on the first. But yeah. Oh, so know. we'll be let, we'll be an hour and a half. <laughs> February one oh. is a uh, what day? And we are going to get to just Wednesday. a plain battery storage Wednesday. by law too. Is, uh, yeah, okay. uh, yeah. I'm about to hand uh, that out to you. I'm about to hand out the draft. Okay. Okay. So. Is the board current and good with February 1, February 8th for our next two meetings? Yes. 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 Okay, excellent. We will have those posted. So uh, I have been uh, looking at uh, and have been looking at the stuff from Medway for a while. <coughs> as I said before, Barbara and Andre, the planning director there, uh, an attorney as well, uh, they do great work. Uh, and the town of Medway has spent a lot of money hiring a lot of consultants to figure out a lot of this stuff. And so, uh, uh, b because it's public domain and we can steal stuff, uh, we're looking at what they've got. So a couple of different things I've got uh, that I'll be sending out to you. Uh, these are some of the information from Medway, including uh, a report that's probably longer than anybody wants to read about research and best practices for battery storage energy systems. Uh, they did a shorter version uh, based on that. And each of these things build on this. So this first one was from February 9th. Uh, and then uh, February 9th, uh, 2022. Uh, so then following up on May 20th, 2022, uh, they came out with a six page battery, battery energy storage consulting guidance for uh, battery or energy storage society. 
Uh, from those two documents, they produced a bylaw uh, that is eight pages for battery energy storage. So I have taken that and essentially edited it to look like it fits in Carver's bylaw as far as numbering goes uh, and incorporated most of those things that they have in there. Uh, I'll hand this out to you as I'm talking about it. So the following is based on Medway's zoning bylaw and work Medway did to hire people. Uh, note Medway has a specific bylaw and has created a dedicated zoning district uh, at the edge of town. Thank you. Uh, Montague, Massachusetts, which is one of the ones the town council had mentioned to us, uses the existing industrial bylaw well, and allows it as a use in the existing uh, district. They break out battery energy storages into two different things, tier one and tier two. Tier one are less than one megawatt. Uh, tier two are greater than one megawatt. And for comparison's sake, the Cranberry Point best uh, battery, battery energy storage that the board approved in 2019 is 150 megawatts, just to give you some scale. So tier one is essentially what you have in your house or your business. Tier two is a commercial sort of venture. And so that's the distinction they make for those. Did I not give you one of those on purpose? I uh, probably. Probably. <laughs> okay. Likely I have another over here. Uh, so that is the, the, the draft. I'm going to be sending it out to uh, uh, to folks as well. In, in addition to the, uh, the, the uh, uh, so that is what I have uh, looked at in the sort of landscape of battery energy storage that's out there right now uh, and things from people who are smart thoughtful and have spent a lot of resources looking at this and over time I mean Medway started this uh, probably 2019 uh, 2016 something like that with an energy committee that they've had and looking at those sort of things the district that they actually created the energy uh, the energy uh, uh, storage uh, district uh, is one of their industrial districts they just took the whole industrial district and said because this is in this location and it's near the power lines it's uh, you know uh, 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 applicable location for that they just took one of their districts and didn't make an overlay they just said the only thing we're going to put in here is is energy storage uh, so that's what they had looked at uh, there uh, and I think that when you look at some of those co-location sort of things you're gonna be surprised at some of the numbers that you see uh, uh, but uh, but I think it's very instructive uh, as far as a starting point uh, for battery energy storage. So you'll have in, in, in sometime later on tonight uh, those documents. I'll send you basically a, an email with links to those uh, documents as well as the heart uh, the, the copies of the text that we've got uh, for your uh, your homework, uh, Roger and uh, um, Sarah. Sarah, I think she took yours. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, both got copies before they left. So okay, that's where we're at with that. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Um, motion to adjourn. Um, I'll before we do that, can I just uh, sure. mention one thing? Um, and this is off the um, Mass DEP site, mm -hmm. the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. Can public water supplies be contaminated by PFAS washing off solar panels and solar sheets installed? PFAS may be generated as waste during the manufacture of the panels. We have not identified any water sampling results that have detected PFAS coming off solar panels or that PFAS is present on panels. That's that's what I read. So and that's Mass DEP. So. Yeah. 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 Tom. Uh, I would love to go down and see that battery storage down in Provincetown. How would I go about doing that? Well, uh, 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 I, I threatened to talk to people about stuff, and this time I actually did. Uh, so I talked to Thaddeus Sewell, uh, who is the town planner in uh, P-Town, uh, and he told me it's an Eversource facility. So Eversource uh, produced a facility uh, on P-Town's uh, landfill. So P-Town is essentially the landlord for this Eversource facility. Uh, and that what it does is it provides stabilization for energy at the end of the Cape, because there's only one power line that takes power out to the end of the Cape, and they lose power so often out there. Uh, they produce this thing, and I think it's 25 megawatts. Uh, but uh, 
that was not my ticket to get in the door. So I, he said, you know, the Eversource folks, you need to talk to them. So I've got a call into Ryan, um, Ryan Eversource, I forget his last name. Earl. Earl, thank you, who was here for the, the Power Lines uh, at the select board meeting a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I, I would go if, yeah. if, if there was a... I'd prefer to go in the shoulder season in February, but I'm... <laughs> Uh, there won't be a, there won't be a line yeah. at the uh, at the battery storage place in, in mm -hmm. February versus uh, August. Hmm. Not that I think there'd be a line in August, hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I'm I'm in the same boat. So I did talk to Thad today. Uh, he's a uh, uh, very cool. accommodating fellow. That'd be great. Perfect. Motion to adjourn. Yeah, I, I just have to thank you for for looking that up because I I felt embarrassed uh, not no thinking that there was PFAS in these things and, uh, and then from what you read, uh, so uh, it'll make me feel better tonight to the, think that I haven't completely lost my mind. Yeah. And the solar guys uh, will guarantee it's not in there, but <laughs> right, I'd no, no, with what Savory came up with. Right, right, yeah. okay. Uh, so we have a motion to hear a second motion by mr. Second Moore. second by John Gatsky uh, Okay, uh, roll call vote John start with you aye. Jim Bogart aye Bruce Mackey aye uh, Neil Shea aye Fred Mello aye Steve Ward aye Savory Moore aye. Okay. Thank you and good night everyone <laughs>